will keep our brother David Meeks and all of the people that are going down to Louisiana with Bread of Life in your prayers. Great ministry and a great opportunity to open doors for the Lord and leave a good impression, a good taste in the mouths of people that God's people, God's church, cares about people all over the world. We appreciate that great ministry and we appreciate your help. And we appreciate the great work that uh, Brother David and the rest of the men that work with him do. And we'll be praying for you. you. You know the old song, he's got the whole world in his hands. But sometimes we doubt it, don't we? Because uh, we look at ourselves and we look at what's happening around us and we're not sure that that's true. Acts seventeen twenty four. many centuries ago, Paul is preaching to the Athenians, the philosophers about the God who made the world and everything in it, he being Lord of heaven and earth, Acts 17, 24. Do you believe that? That he's Lord of heaven and earth, that he truly has his hands on the things of the earth. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Do you believe that? The psalmist did. Colossians 1.14, talking about Jesus who created all things. And then he says, and in him all things hold together. Colossians 1.17. You believe that? That God, that Jesus is holding all things together? You know, the, the world is so big and there's so much going on. And we've got it right in our face every day, don't we? We watch the news and we get, we get everybody's twisted versions of what's going on. But there's undoubtedly a lot happening in the world, and we seem very small to ourselves. When I consider the heavens, the works of thy fingers, Psalm 8, uh, all the worlds which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? I'm, I'm very small, and God is so huge and so big. Do you believe that everything really is in his hands? Romans 8, 28 says, God works everything together for the good of them that love God and are the called. And he does it according to his purpose. If that verse is true, and I believe it is, then not only is the world and everything in it in God's hand, but he's got a purpose. He's got a plan. He's working that plan. He's working all the good stuff and the bad stuff together for the good of his purpose. And we're part of that purpose, whether we realize it or not. You've got inside your bulletin and on an orange piece of paper there an outline to fill in to help you follow along. And so if you're filling in that outline, point number one, we little people down here often find ourselves living in circumstances beyond our control. Now, I've been studying the book of Daniel for a few weeks. And Daniel is a perfect example of that. In, in 605, 606 B.C., Judah was on the way down as a kingdom, as a nation. I don't know where we are as a kingdom, as a nation, whether maybe we're on the way down. I don't know. But Judah was, and so much so that Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon, came against the city of Jerusalem. And he didn't destroy it. He was still being patient with it. But he took Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, in bronze shackles, took him captive to Babylon. And along with Jehoiakim, he picked a number of the young nobles, men of Judah that were of the nobility. He took them with him to Babylon. And these included people like Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael. Now these people were taken away and their world was crumbling and everything changed for them in a heartbeat. About 18 years later, the entire city of Jerusalem fell. It was destroyed. Countless hundreds and thousands died and more people were taken captive into Babylon. You know, circumstances were totally beyond those people's control at that point. They were swept up in a war. They were swept up into a different country. They had no choice in the matter. You know... Things seem chaotic in our world today. And sometimes, big or small, we're swept up into circumstances that we can't control. And we have to live in those circumstances. We're caught up in, in economic shifts and changes. We're caught up in government shifts and changes and policy shifts and changes. We're caught up in natural disasters like these people in Louisiana 
can't do anything about it. Uh, we're caught up in uh, all kinds of different things. We're caught up in health problems and wars sometimes. What can we do about it? Well, we can't do anything but adjust and adapt. And you've heard the uh, saying, when life gives you lemons, what do you do? Well, you make lemonade. You adapt and you adjust and you live. God has never promised us a consistency of circumstances. Circumstances are always going to be changing. Whatever circumstances we find ourselves, we've got to live uh, for the Lord. Uh, this slide you're seeing right now, uh, back in the time when uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak was the president of Egypt not too long ago, and the people started rioting and rebelling, and things got so bad in Egypt, uh, there were a number of American families living and working in e Egypt, and uh, it was decided that they had to be deported. We didn't know if they were safe or not. These people are taken up out of their jobs and their livelihoods and their lives, and they're wondering if they're safe. What do they do? Well, they just have to roll with it. They have to make lemonade out of the lemons. Um, in New York, think if you'd lived in New York during 9-11, how chaotic things must have seemed. The circumstances were totally thrown upside down. People had to live in a different way. Their whole world seemed different. What do they do? Well, God expects us, like he expected Daniel and those young men, to just live for him in the circumstances. But, you know, when we think of our own lives and we, we get so focused on ourselves and we think about what we're dealing with in our circumstances, I want you to realize that in the middle of whatever circumstances you find yourself at this moment, our God is in control. Take the camera off of yourself and start focusing backward, 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 up into the heavens. And this brings us to point number two. God sees and controls the big picture of human history. See, we're part of that. Our little lives and our little circumstances. But God sees the whole thing. Think how Daniel felt when he was uh, roughly taken out of his home with those other nobles and he was taken off into a foreign land, into a culture that he didn't understand. His name was Daniel, which means God is my judge. Even his name had El or God in the name. And you know what the first thing they did to him was? They changed his name. They gave him a pagan name. They started calling him Belteshazzar. And they changed those other boys' names from Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. They changed them to the names we know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were pagan names. They even took their names away from them. Their, everything was different. They tried to change everything on those young men. And yet Daniel, in the process of his life, learned that God was still in control. Did you know that God is in control of every country, of every city, of all the movers and all the shakers and all the players, that they are in God's hands, including that great Babylonian ruler, Nebuchadnezzar, proud and fierce, the greatest man of his day. He was in the hands of God. So in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, this great man, seemingly untouchable by things, had a dream, and it really bothered him. <clears throat> He couldn't remember it, but he knew it was mo monumental, and he asked all of his wise men to interpret the dream, and of course the pagan magicians and enchanters and sorcerers didn't have anything for him, and so finally Daniel and the three young men prayed, and God revealed the dream uh, to Daniel. So when Daniel came in before Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel revealed in just a moment a thousand years of history to Nebuchadnezzar. And he, he showed him this dream of this great statue that he dreamed about with a head of gold and chest and arms of silver and belly and thighs of brass and feet and legs of iron mixed with clay. And Daniel began to explain to him the great wisdom of God for the next thousand years. Now see, we think of right now, don't we? We think of what's happening to us today in this moment at this time. And here's God looking at thousands of years in one whack. And so he tells Daniel, and then Daniel tells the king, King, you are the head of gold. And then he shocks Nebuchadnezzar, the great man, and says, After you, what? After me? After you will arise another kingdom inferior to yours. What do you mean after me? I thought I was going to be king forever. After me. Did you realize, folks? That if history continues very soon, there's going to be an after me. There's going to be an after you, see. He said, after you, there's going to arise another kingdom. And then there's going to be a third kingdom. 
And then a fourth kingdom. And he told him all about the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire and the great Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great. And he told him about the great Roman Empire. And so in telling him that dream, he gave him a sweeping scene of a thousand years of history in which he was just a tiny player on the stage of God's great purpose. Daniel let him know, let great King Nebuchadnezzar know that our life is but a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Listen to what Paul told those Athenians. It really fits right here. God made from one person every nation of men to dwell upon the face of the earth. Listen. Having determined their appointed seasons and the boundaries of their habitations. Did you get that? God has determined the appointed seasons of every nation and the boundaries of their habitations. When Daniel was given the revelation of uh, this great dream in Daniel 2 verse 20, Daniel said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power belong to him. Now listen to what he said next. He changes the times and the seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them doesn't Romans 13 say every power that exists is ordained by God it is God who sits above the kingdoms of the earth and the great tectonic shifts in the plates of human history are the shifts made by God and we are not permanent in our governments and in our kingdoms but we are temporary and God is saying, and after you, there will arise another. And after them, there will arise another. We need to know where we fit on the stage. There were a number of kings even in the life of Daniel. In Daniel's life, uh, he was taken captive in 605 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar reigned for several more years, not that many more years. And before they knew it, Nebuchadnezzar was dead and his son Belshazzar was the ruler. And Belshazzar shortly uh, ruled and then died. And then Darius the Mede was the king. And he's the famous one you all remember from Daniel. Daniel in the Lie, Lie, Lions den, you know. That was Darius the Mede that was king. Uh, that threw Daniel in the lion's den. And then Cyrus the Persian came along. And it was Cyrus the Persian that decreed that the people of Israel could go home. And you can read about him in the end of the books of Kings and in the books of Ezra and in the books of Chronicles and all these other places. And if you read the book of Daniel, his latest revelations were in the time of Cyrus the Persian. But if you read all of the book of Daniel, if you read the uh, 10th through the 12th chapters, Daniel even told Cyrus the Persian, the great Persian leader, he said, you know, there's going to come this king, and he's going to come from Greece. And he's going to destroy everything you've built, and his empire's going to stretch to the horizons. And he told him in detail about the Ptolemaic and Seleucid kings, the northern and southern kings, and told him everything that was going to happen for hundreds of years down to the time of the Roman Empire. And Cyrus is sitting there, you mean I'm not going to last forever? See, none of us are going to last forever. And Daniel saw that the world is shifting and moving in the hands of Almighty God. Well, number three on your outline today, even while these great shifts are taking place in the kingdoms of the world and God is moving things around, God's attention is still on each one of his people in all these circumstances. Think about Daniel swept up into these circumstances over which he had absolutely no control, but God was watching him. And let me tell you this morning, church, that whatever circumstances you are swept up into in your life, God is watching you. You are one of God's people, and you are important to him. The God that has his eye on every sparrow that falls, that God is watching us. Each one of us shall give an account of himself to God, uh, Psalm, uh, or Romans 14, 12. Psalm 139, there's not a word you're going to speak or a thought in your head that God doesn't know Already, So even in the midst of all this, Daniel wanted to live like a child of God, and God appreciated it. Daniel and these three young men were placed in a three-year training course. Did you know that? 
And they were taught the language and literature of the Babylonians. They were taught Aramaic and they were taught Babylonian literature. And they, they were prepped as, as advisors to, to the kings. And in the course of this, uh, they came a, a moral dilemma to these young men because the Babylonians didn't eat the diet that's prescribed in the book of Leviticus for the Jewish people. I mean, the Babylonians had ham sandwiches and didn't think a word about it, you know. They had a BLT, and it was no problem. They could eat catfish, and it was no biggie. But if you read the book of Le uh, Leviticus, all those things were prohibited for children of the nation of Israel. And so when they started trying to give all this stuff to these three young men, these guys had courage. In fact, it says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel resolved in his heart not to defile himself, himself with the king's rich food and wine. He made, a, he made a commitment in his heart that even in this foreign country, even in these crazy circumstances, he was going to try to do the will of God. And God blessed them and gave them success and exalted them above the others. And Daniel 1 verse 20 says, These four young men turned out ten times better than all of the other people in that training program because God is able to bless his people in whatever circumstance they find themselves. The young nobles faced idolatry in Daniel chapter 3. In this case, Nebuchadnezzar built a 90 foot high and 9 foot wide statue in the plain of Dura. And as a show of loyalty of all these captives and peoples, he said that everyone under his rule had to bow down and worship this image that he set up in the plain of Dura. And there were three young nobles that were affected by this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they wouldn't do it. And so they were charged by the people that were jealous of their success. And, and Nebuchadnezzar insisted that they bow down and worship this image. There are some Jews who pay no attention to you, said these who detracted from them to King Nebuchadnezzar. But then in Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, and I want to read this to you because it's one of my favorite scriptures in the book of Daniel. Daniel 3, verse 17 and 18. These young men said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he doesn't rescue us, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. It's interesting in the book of Daniel, I don't have time to talk to you about this, but the word set up is very important all the way through the book of Daniel. And it talks about all the things that men set up and how temporary those things are that men set up and how fallible those things are that men set up. But that the things that God sets up last forever. See, So they said, we're not going to worship this image that you've set up. You know the story how they threw them into the fiery furnace and their clothes weren't even singed and there appeared to be another heavenly being in there and, and the men that threw them in the furnace died. And finally, the king decreed after this, when he was shown to respect God, he says, therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can deliver in this way. Do you see how these young men in terrible circumstances were lights shining in the darkness? They were, they were a beacon showing God to people who needed to know God and God blessed them mightily. Every one of you knows the story of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel came into a crisis because of his prayer life. Now, Daniel went to his room three times, count them, three times every day. It says Daniel 6, verse 10. And he got down on his knees and he faced Jerusalem and he prayed earnestly to the God of heaven. All during this time when he was in Babylonian captivity, through all these different rulers and kings, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he sought the Lord in a personal relationship with God. Well, you know, some of those other government factotums, all those satraps and magistrates and governors and we'd say governors and senators and mayors and uh, every, every level of government in the whole wide world. They were jealous of Daniel and so they told the king. And the king had made this rash decree that 
you can't pray to anybody but the king, and Daniel didn't listen to it. Daniel prayed to God. Daniel's relationship with God was first. And so Daniel was thrown into the den of lions, and you know the story, how God delivered him from the den of lions. Because God does bless and deliver his people. So let me tell you this, and this is what this means to us today. Some of you are going through some hard stuff. Some of, some of you are going through really bad health problems. Some of you are going through job problems. Some of you are going through family problems. Some of you are going through uh, all kinds of other problems that we don't know about. But let me tell you this. In whatever problem you find yourself, in what are, whatever circumstances you're caught up in, God is watching you. And you are powerful in those circumstances. And your life can, can be good and it can receive the blessings of God even in those evil circumstances and you can be a great example to other people. And we do serve a God that blesses and delivers his people in whatever circumstances. Number four on your outline. God holds everyone accountable for their behavior. God doesn't just hold the little people accountable for their behavior. He holds the big people accountable too. In Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had walked out onto the roof of his palace and he looked at his kingdom and he says is not this great Babylon that I have built with my own hands and for the glory of my own majesty and then he had this dream that really messed up his head it was a dream about this great beautiful tree that was so big it nearly filled the earth and all the people and animals came and sh uh, got shade under its branches then all of a sudden this tree was cut down to nothing but a stump and uh, it was a strange dream and nobody could tell him what it meant but in came Daniel, Belteshazzar, as his name had been changed to. And Daniel was a little bit nervous because he knew that this dream was not good news for Nebuchadnezzar. But it was really God's discipline on Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, the reason you've gotten this dream, Nebuchadnezzar, is so that the living may know, Daniel 4, 17, that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes... And sets up over them the lowest of men. Here's what's going to happen to you, Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to be taken from power. You're going to lose your mind. You're going to go out and not wear any clothes. And crawl around on the ground like an animal. And your fingernails are going to grow long. And your hair is going to grow long. And you're going to be totally out there and humiliated beyond measure. Until you learn who's in charge. And so it happened. Nebuchadnezzar was taken down. And finally, Nebuchadnezzar had been out there acting like an animal long enough. And it says in Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. And my sanity was restored. And then I praised the Most High and I honored and glorify him who lives forever and ever. Listen, if you stop glorifying and honoring and praising and trusting the God of heaven, you're insane. And you need to get your sanity restored until you realize who's in charge and who we really need to serve and what our real duty is in this life. And so Nebuchadnezzar did just that. And the Bible says at the end of Daniel chapter 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, now praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble my goodness, folks, God is in charge of our world. God is in charge of our lives. God holds us in the palm of his hand. And those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. Hebrews 12, verse 28, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks and worship God with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's son. And he was weighed in the balances and found wanting. Now, remember when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple and he took away all the holy vessels of the temple? Here was Belshazzar, who had no respect for God. He took the holy vessels of the temple that were used in the worship of God and he had a big pagan party with it and drank wine out of those bowls and partied with God's holy vessels and worshiped the gods of gold and silver and everything. And while that was going on, a hand appeared. A hand. And the hand went over to the wall and wrote, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharsin, 
which means your days have been numbered. Mene, your days are numbered. Uh, Tekel, you've been weighed in the balances, Belshazzar, and you've been found wanting. Listen to me, church. Every one of us is going to be weighed in the balances of the Almighty. And our days are numbered, every one of us. You've been weighed in the balances, he said to Belshazzar, the great king, and you've been found wanting. And then Upharsin means your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that very night, God killed that king. And Darius the Mede became the king over that empire. Finally, number five today, this is, this is the punchline of the book of Daniel. The only kingdom that really matters is God's eternal kingdom. Throughout the book of Daniel, you can read this, this refrain over and over. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. That's talking about God's kingdom. See, the title of this lesson is in his hands, in God's hands. When Daniel was revealing that thousand years of history to Nebuchadnezzar, and he told him about the Babylonian kingdom and the Medo-Persian kingdom and the Greek kingdom and the Roman kingdom, when he got down to that Roman kingdom, you know what Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2, verse 44? In the days of these kings, that's the Roman kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, neither shall the sovereignty of that kingdom be left unto any other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms of the earth and it will stand forever. That's the kingdom of God. And our King Jesus Christ is over that kingdom. Folks, I don't know who's going to win the election. I don't know if we're going to be Donaldized or Hillaryized. And I don't know what in the world's going to happen four years after that or a thousand years after that. But this I know. God is king. God is sovereign. He has this world in his hands. And the one we need to serve is our God. We sang the song, How Great Is Our God. He is great, and we are in his hands. So let us be under his rule, respecting that that's the only rule that really matters. If you're here today and we can help you to be a part of the kingdom of God, that's what we'd love to do. If we can pray with you about anything, please let it be known. Come as we stand together and as we sing.